No. <laughs> nope. Kind of like that. We are making progress. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the time, Perfect timing. The timing of that. <laughs> Hello there! My name is Brent, and this is the abandoned mining town of Cerro Gordo. Back in the 1800s, they pulled $500 million worth of minerals from these hills behind me. Eventually, the mine went bust, but for the past three years, this has been my home, where I spend my days trying to bring life back to this place. So this video is three years living in an abandoned mining town. Alright, so three years, three years, 36 months. That is how long I have been calling Cerro Gordo this beautiful former mining town all around me home. You know, I remember March of 2020 sitting in my tiny base model Tacoma in Austin, Texas. You know, I had just packed up my entire apartment and I was debating. You know, there was a lot of uncertainty during that time. This is the very, very beginning of the pandemic. And I remember playing out how both paths might go. You know, stay in Austin in a comfortable life that I was very familiar with, or start driving and go towards what could be the adventure of a lifetime. And eventually, you know, I found hand just putting the car in drive, taking off, and my life has definitely not been the same since. So it has been three years living here and sometimes just the amount of things that have happened during that time slipped my mind. But I think on big moments, you know, anniversaries, it's important to take a little bit of a walk down memory lane and try to give a little bit of space and appreciation all that has happened over the last three years. So I felt just the best way to do that was take a stroll back through town. You know, even starting with the road. I remember my first day up here, I couldn't even make my truck all the way into town. Now, you know, I walk past that same spot and just think of all the material we've been able to bring up and down it. You know, hundreds of thousands of pounds of concrete, thousands of cinder blocks, just pallets and pallets of wood even a 40,000 gallon water tank. You know, the hotel that has basically consumed my life for the past two and a half years is now able to be walked on. But I remember having to learn how to use a backhoe to dig the trenches for the footers. You know, then banging my head against the wall when I couldn't get any concrete company to fill in those ditches. You know, then the relief and the excitement that came when Dave Sparks came with just a fleet of vehicles and for the first time of many, we pulled off the impossible. Uh, I remember the day we had to cut and mix 1500 concrete bags just to get it finished. It was such an insane day with such an insane crew of people that none of us will ever forget. You know, as I walk further up the road, the museum used to be just a storage place for items found far beyond my time here. But now when I walk in, I see my own memories over the past three years. You know, I see the dynamite door that I dragged out of the 700 foot level of the mine. I see the other dynamite door that we pulled out when Dave Sparks was here. You know, there's minerals in there that I painstakingly chiseled from 400 feet under the earth coins that we found on metal detecting events that are just pieces of history. You know, outside on the porch, I look over to the bunkhouse and that's a place that once felt so dark and spooky to me. And then it turned into a place where I just spent countless hours refinishing, repainting, redecorating. And ever since hundreds of volunteers have been able to utilize that space. And I can't help but just smile thinking about how that space has turned around over the past three years. You know, from the same porch, I can see the Belshaw house, or these days, my house. You know, not just a place that Belshaw once lived, but a place that I have now lived for 
literally years, you know, where I've shared meals with friends. You know, I see it not just as this falling down piece of history, but as my home. And further along, as I get to the assay office, I see a building that once upon a time, I could enthusiastically describe the building. I could describe the tests that they did to the minerals there to determine the value. But since I moved here, I've now made silver from ore. I've done dozens of assays myself. I'm talking from experience now. You know, I've used assaying to determine the value of the waste minerals from some of the old owners here. You know, and as I walk up towards the main hoist, I stop at the saddle and just overlook Death Valley. I've taken some of the most beautiful hikes of my life in the area, you know, to forgotten mining towns like Beverage, you know, along the crazy feat of engineering that is the salt tram. And as I finally venture up to the hoist, probably the most memories come flooding back to me. You know, that's where the Union Mine is. That's the mine that built Los Angeles. That's the mine where they pulled $500 million of the minerals out of. You know, I remember starting off with the discount Home Depot rope and very timidly going down maybe a 10 foot shaft. And then eventually I was repelling hundreds of feet with no support, just dangling in voids that could be potentially a thousand feet deep. You know, I've squeezed into the 200 level, the most infamous level in all of Cerro Gordo. I even found a pair of elusive Levi jeans that I was just so obsessed with for my first year here. I've stopped more times than I want to count at the 700 foot level where the water is. And eventually after enough time, I made my way all the way down to the bottom of the shaft, you know, the 900 foot level, this infamous level that so few people have ever seen. You know, I've repelled at this point into the Jefferson Chimney, an area that previous reports have deemed just inaccessible, only to have just the craziest mine exploration of my life. You know, as I think about all of that, you know, and as I walk out towards the cliff that overlooks my home, that overlooks Cerro Gordo, that overlooks Owens Lake, all of these memories come flooding back. It's been a long three years. It's been a challenging three years, but I feel like that I've packed more living into these past 36 months than I could have anywhere else in the world. And overlooking the town, my home, I just can't feel anything but gratitude. You know, I have absolutely no idea what the next three years will hold, but I do know on the other end of it, no matter the good, the bad things that happen, I will be a different person. You know, given that it's been three years that I've been living up here, I've been thinking a lot about three things that I like a lot more about my life since moving to Cerro Gordo, and maybe three things that I wish could be more similar to my old life. You know, first, I've hit it already almost to death, but community. You know, I found somehow more community in an abandoned ghost town than I ever did living in major cities. I think part of it is the fact that Everybody out here knows what it's like to live so far removed from everybody else. Everybody knows that sometimes it's quite literally life or death, you know, helping your neighbor out. Uh, second would be nature. Connection to nature up here and living according to it is something that I think has brought me a lot of peace. Up here, you know, I kind of rise with the sun and go to bed not too long after it's gone. And some days you just have to submit yourself. You know, if it's raining, you might not get anything done that day. Third, probably thing that I like the most over when I first moved here is just myself. You know, I think that I am significantly more self-reliant these days, more confident and more just able to handle anything thrown my way. On the flip side of the coin, uh, to keep it pretty brief, if I think about things that I wish were closer to my old life, I would have to say, uh, first is just grocery stores and access to fresh produce. I've said this before, but I would love to eat much more healthy, um, but the closest grocery store is an hour away and it has a very limited selection. I miss the serendipitous, just kind of like run-ins with friends in the street, you know? Uh, that occasionally happens here. You know, as I m m know more and more people in the area, I go back to the community. I do just run into friends, just even in the streets here at Cerro Gordo. But that, that happened a lot more in these established towns. 
Uh, third, and this is probably gonna be the most obvious, running water, you know. It has been three years of on and off running water. We've tried a lot of things, you know. We go down into the mine to get the pump going and it freezes. There's trucking up water that we currently do and then sometimes the pipes freeze, sometimes they don't. But running water is one of those things that you definitely underappreciate until you're without it, you know. If you can just turn on sinks and wash dishes, wash yourself, just flush toilets, all those things. That is a Probably the third thing I miss. The positives far, far, far outweigh any negatives. Otherwise I wouldn't be here, you know? I truly love this place and I love the way it's developing. And a lot of these things that I necessarily don't like are fixable. Like water, for instance, is on the agenda for this year to fix in a big way. You know, I'll discuss that more in just a minute when we talk about all the water activities that have been going on around here. But I think being up here has changed me into a better person. I hope it continues to change me into a better person. I hope it continues to just bring me that fulfillment with tapping into something larger than myself. Um, and with that, let's take a trip down the hill and talk about water just a little bit more. All right, so another huge thing that's been happening in this area over the past little bit has been happening right behind me. This is the former site of Owens Lake. So back in the 1800s, this lake was 110 square miles. So imagine a lake that's four times the size of Manhattan. Cerro Gordo would use this lake to ship their supplies across it. You know, at one point this was 70 feet deep, this dirt that you're seeing behind me. But Thanks to Mr. William Mulholland and Fred Eaton, they decided that the water here in Owens Lake was better used 150 miles away in Los Angeles. And so they devised the plan of the Los Angeles Aqueduct. And so this lake's death became Los Angeles' future. It is the reason it was able to bloom into the metropolis that it is today. It created a lot of problems around here. It created a lot of toxic dust, it created social economic problems, all sorts of other things. But the reason that I'm bringing it up right now is because recently all of the snow that the Sierra's got, all of the rain that we've been getting has forced DWP, the Department of Water and Power, to redirect some of the water back into the lake. Their aqueduct, their fake river that they created overflowed. So they put billions and billions of gallons of water back into the lake, creating the most full lake that I have seen in my entire time at Cerro Gordo. And it's just been beautiful. And so for me, this feels like a historic event, you know, to get out there, see the lake the most full that it's ever been. So I got on my dirt bike, I drove out all over the lake that you see behind me, finding little isthmus that it didn't create before, peninsulas, islands, all these different really cool trails. I even got a chance to kayak the Owens Lake, which I don't know uh, who has been able to do that in who knows when. You know, eventually this lake will be back, whether it's 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, nature is always gonna win. You know, Los Angeles is gonna dry up and fry up no matter what. Uh, they need to figure out a different solution. It's gonna be desalination, maybe something else. But one day this lake will return and I can only imagine what the views must be like from Cerro Gordo. We currently truck up our water. We will truck up the water for the hotel, but also all of this snow melt and this rain leads me to believe that this is the year that we finally drill for a well. You know, I think if the town is gonna become infinitely more sustainable, so in the coming months, I'm gonna be exploring hydrogeologists, you know, who knows, I'll be getting to dowsing, whatever we need to do, but water is a huge focus for this year. So stay tuned for a lot more on water in the desert and how we're gonna get that. All right, so just about a year ago, this was an abandoned dynamite vault, meaning this is where they would put all the dynamite they were gonna use on the upper levels of the Union Mine and just store it. You know, it would have to be behind two doors legally to keep it safe, this metal door, then you can see the door behind it with the caution explosives. And about a year ago, it was just a hole in the ground. You know, this was just a vacant hole that had a dirt floor and wasn't being really used for anything. And me, I'm a huge book lover. So about a year ago, I spent a lot of time 
and we took a lot of wood out of the main Union Mine here, shined it up, and turned this small little hole into a library. And I gotta say, it became one of my favorite buildings, if not my favorite place in all Cerro Gordo to just go, tuck away, you know, and just get away from it all. And when I made it, I said, hey, if you have a book about mining, you want to send our way, you know, we'd love to create kind of the biggest repository of mining in Western history. And you guys absolutely delivered. You know, we have so many books now that all of the shelves inside the library are full to the point where I just have boxes and boxes of books. And so that leads me to our second library that we are going to be opening. Go for it. All right, so two years ago, this was just a falling down skeleton of a shack. And with the help of a lot of volunteers, we spent a ton of time making this back into probably the coolest cabin at Cerro Gordo. You know, the original door had this tin on it that we recycled, so there's these old tin cans for me, it has one of the best views over all of Owens Valley and Mount Whitney. And so my hope now is that we can go in here, create some shelves, maybe create some benches out here. So when people visit, they can come up here, grab a book, you know, maybe sit out here, enjoy the water and just look over all the valley. A lot of this material is all recycled. You know, this stuff all came from around Cerro Gordo. There's even boards here that still have bullets in them that we found as we reclaimed the wood. You know, the wood is still stamped Cerro Gordo mines from back in the day. So we tried to create it basically like a cabin might have been for one of the miners that were living here. It's big, it's spacious, and it's just horribly underutilized, to be honest with you. And so we're going to turn it into a cabin that a miner might have stayed at with a great love of reading. You know, you'll be able to come up here read a book about the history of the town with the whole town in your purview. And I think that just adds so much more richness to the experience of being anywhere. If you can understand its history. All right, so come take a look at the library as it stands. Kurt and Phil have been doing an awesome job. We got ourselves shelves that are about the sturdiest shelves can get. These books will get taken out of those boxes and put up here. And then here's kind of the observation, reflection, right? A book seat. This piece of wood was donated to us a couple years ago. A guy, Jacobus, gave us seven different milled trees. And now it's uh, built into the side here. You know what? So hopefully you can come up here, write your next great American novel here. Come over here. Grab yourself a book. If you need to do a little research, there's gonna be every mining book you can imagine. Come over here. Ah, read your little book. Do you want to just put the book over here? Put the book over here. A lot of these books have nice notes in them too. This says, greetings from Idaho, from Carl. Carl sent ghost towns to ghost town. So thank you, Carl. But uh, this is such a more usable space. We can't wait for you guys to come up, check it out and uh, get inspired. So this is before the sheathing goes down, but you can see a lot of the joists are in. Over here, we're getting some steel beams that are gonna go across to really support. This is kind of the loading bay area. So when supplies come in, they'll get loaded in here. And so the plan is this week to put the sheathing over this, so the plywood all over this. So then instead of having to work with the material down there, all the material will be up here to then work over on that section of the hotel. So pretty crazy to see it coming together, you know? Hopefully this thing stands for many, many years. That's your view. Hard to beat. Well, that's up really late, but I have to say, thank you so much for the silver plaque for my second channel, Ghost Town 2. And you know, anytime we get these plaques, the eye was more interesting. The first one went in a time capsule that's underneath the hotel. The second one went to the 900 foot level of Cerro Union Mine. This one is going somewhere very special. 
So let's get it unwrapped. I'm gonna show you guys where this is going. Down in there. <laughs> right now I am sitting on the first floor of the Future American Hotel. It is done, it is rough framed, I am sitting on it, I am imagining just generations of people coming up here, dancing, laughing, and just having an amazing time. If you've been watching this channel for a very long time, you know that the process of getting here has just been a quest of all quests. It has required more machinery than I could ever imagine. It's tested me mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, in every way possible. You know, I remember when we lost the first hotel in 2020, I was just devastated. I remember the day after I just felt probably more lost than I ever have in my life. And a guy came up, a friend of mine, actually the old owner of the town, and he put his hand on my shoulder. We exchanged some words and he said, you know, what happens from here is up to you. And I feel very fortunate to be on a journey like this. And my hope day in and day out is just to preserve everything here for future generations. And along the way, it has been the most difficult journey of my life. It's just been emotional, to be fully honest with you. It has felt like I have touched every single part of this hotel and had to learn so many skills along the way. And hundreds of people have the same experience, you know? At this point, hundreds of people have helped rebuild this hotel and hundreds of them have their own tie to this place forever. You know, the big question is always, when is this gonna be done? <laughs> and the answer I always, always say is a month or two from now, but in uh, more realistic terms, I hope to have this thing enclosed in actually a month or two. But my hope is that by this time next year, this hotel is not only built, it's up, it's running, it's able to support guests and all of you out there can come and just enjoy this beautiful space that I've been fortunate enough to live in for the past three years. But we're not there yet. There is a lot to continue doing, which leads me to my next point, and which is a way to continue supporting this hotel as it goes up, uh, and also incorporates a new passion of mine that you may have seen in the last video. If you guys watched my last video, you saw that I went down to the 400 foot level of the main mine here, went down this little kind of rabbit hole, and ended up bringing up just some beautiful specimens. But when I brought these back up, and we brought them down to the Gem and Mineral Society. And I remember that aha moment kind of happened when I put this piece underwater. You know, it almost takes your breath away how beautiful some of these minerals that were left behind in the mines were. You know, I was always interested in this stuff like Galena. You know, I always thought that this is what built this town. But since then, I've gotten into Smithsonite, you know, more Smithsonite. And that has led to two things. Uh, first, a new display case proudly displayed here at the Cerro Gordo Museum and uh, Old General Store is gonna display some of the best specimens that I find out in the mines. Yep, and I'll hold on to it. Okay, which way do you want to orient it? Like this? this? This was some of the Smith's night we found recently at the 400. This is Galena, which you gotta have to Galena if you're gonna have a display case at Cerro Gordo. You might find a better piece of Galena than that. This came at the 200 level. And I don't know if you can see the blue and the green in it, but I've never seen another one. And this came out of the 200, which is very hard to get to. That might even be turquoise right there. Naturally occurring turquoise with chrysocol and malachite too, which is pretty cool. All right, so we're gonna add the very rare blue Smithsonite, so people can come and look at that. But this is the piece that people really liked in the video scene. This is the one with the gold veins. If you look closely, uh, there's gold vein in there with the copper, with the Smithsonite, with all the other stuff. It is quite a specimen, so it'll be right here if you guys wanna come check it out. And number two, the second thing that a lot of people have asked since my last video is how could they have a small piece of Cerro Gordo at their own home? You know, and my mentality from day one has been that everything at Cerro Gordo needs to stay at Cerro Gordo. 
That said, we also have an extremely expensive hotel just down the way to build. So all that to say, I'm going to start, I'm going to try a small online rock shop. But these are all going to be some of my favorite things down there. They're all going to come with a little video of where I found them, you know, when I found them, along with a certificate, you know, saying that this is from Cerro Gordo. And the idea is that keeps the hotel running. You know, that keeps us building, uh, keeps momentum going. And so, you know, if you're interested, I'm going to put the link below. It'll be helping the town. And uh, I can't wait to just continue scratching this rock hounding bug that I seem to have captured since my last video or so. You know, another thing that's definitely increased over the last three years is just how much of my personal information is out there. You know, I don't know if you've done a search for yourself recently, but pretty much anybody, it seems that you can find all sorts of their personal information for sale on all these different websites. You know, and these data brokers that are selling that are just making like a fortune. You know, they're selling it to robocallers, spammers, and all these other different people. And the other thing is identity theft. You know, since starting this channel, I've had to deal with that for a number of times. You know, people trying to impersonate me um, for a variety of reasons. And so that's why I'm so excited about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura is kind of just this one-stop shop for all of your personal information and identity online. You know, they contact the data brokers that are selling your information on those different websites and make them take it down. You know, they monitor everything going on to your personal identity to make sure it's not being stolen. Now, for anybody watching this channel, they're giving away a 14-day free membership. All you have to do is go to aura.com slash ghost town living. So A-U-R-A dot com slash ghost town living. And I'm gonna give you a 14-day trial. Again, it's something that I just can't keep up with up here. You know, the internet's always the, not always the best. I'm always busy. So I hope you go, I hope you go check it out. All right, so we are on potentially a very exciting mission. Phil just was walking and uh, there is a part of the road that just kind of collapsed. And in this collapse, it might have happened because there was a lot of snow collecting, because of a lot of the rocks, who knows why. But anyways, the point is below the collapse is a mine tunnel that is far beyond the hoist house. So this potentially could lead into the 86. Maybe it leads into the Omega. We won't know till we find out. So we have a whole crew. Hello, everyone. And uh, we're we're gonna go we're gonna go check it out. All right, so we're here. This is the, uh, the kind of hole. That, and you can see because of all the new dirt, it's a recent collapse. And it seemed to just kind of fall in on itself and open up that. So Wade's here. Wade's excited. All right. Woo. You can tell, but in here, just oh wow, it's just such soft rock. This is just like what they call like country rock, really old stuff. So this would have been probably some of the original kind of timbering. Back till you can tell, no one has walked in here. And, a very long time and yeah unfortunately this way probably the same thing you know just a lot of loose rock collapsed down there go back out this way there was a left that we can check out but this would have been maybe some even the pre-workings pre you know main union mine and all that and then this so this is different than a collapse this is a purposeful backfill so they stacked this rock to not go different ways. So this could have at one point gone back into the Union. But you could tell how perfectly they stacked it that, oh, it keeps going. I thought that might have been it, but it's just some old working. This might be some of the oldest workings in all of Cerro Gordo. It just isn't, you don't see this type of workings in the Union a lot. It's much better than this typically. But look at how loose this rock is. And what it feels like, ah, dang it. There we go. That's as far as they got. <sighs> that was so exciting for such a brief period of time. Thought this was gonna lead all the way and I was trying to underplay it to the camera, but that's part of the game. You know, maybe one day we'll come back here, 
start undoing some of these fills that we have in here. Um, but for now, maybe we'll grab that wheelbarrow and uh, that's the end of the exploration. All right, so another update. Right now I am standing or kind of slouching on the side of a snow bank right in front of what is the Omega Tunnel here at Cerro Gordo. This tunnel used to lead directly in to the 200 foot level of the Union Mine. And that's been important for a couple of reasons. One, it was a portal to the outside, meaning you could walk from the main workings of the Union Mine right out to the exit. And in the 1800s, there was a huge fire and the miners escaped using this Omega Tunnel all the way out. The less exciting update about the 200 level is that in the 1870s, that's where the collapse happened that killed around 30 miners. So the rock here is not very safe, but it is an entrance into the Union Mine not using the hoist. And the hoist requires a huge crew. You know, you need at least four or five guys to run it. And this, if it were to open, could potentially just open up miles and miles of mines for me to explore. Now, the problem is when I first learned about the Omega Tunnel, I came over here and nothing was in sight. You know, years and years and years of collapse had happened. So that meant I was gonna have to dig. And so I remember for the first two years of being up here, I was just obsessed with getting into this tunnel. So every night after we did all my work, I would come over here in the backhoe and just for hours and hours and hours every night, dig and dig and dig. You know, I imagined the day that I took one scoop, you know, and the dirt fell away and there was just a direct shaft all the way into the Union Mine. <laughs> and after a very long time of digging, that wasn't quite happening. And I remember one of my mentors up here, Tip, he came and he walked and he saw what I was digging. He looked out at the tailings pile and he noticed that I was digging just at a slight angle up, you know, just a few inches up. And I remember then he's like, dig straight down. It's remember the backhoe digging straight down and hitting timber. You know, the timber that supported the portal that was the entrance into the Union Mine. And so I remember being so excited. I remember digging for hours and hours and hours, getting into here. And that excitement, unfortunately, was a little bit short lived because once the rock fell away, the tunnel did exist just as I had imagined it. But unfortunately, a few hundred yards back, it was collapsed. And the reason this collapse is so enticing is because when you look at it, there's mold or something growing on the wood and it's flapping out, it's flapping out the portal, meaning air is coming through the shaft and pushing out through this collapse at a pretty good amount. And truly at night, I would dream about, you know, breaking through that small collapse and getting to the other side. <laughs> um, and recently, Jason came back and it seems that the Omega bug has bit Jason in the same way that it bit me because one of the first things he wanted to do after we went down in the main mine, got some minerals, was go back into here. Jason, what are we trying to do? Oh, we're trying to get into the Omega tunnel <laughs> and there's a lot of snow in front of it. So hopefully we can get in there and get to that collapse part yep. and get it opened up and see what's behind it. Yes. Woo. <laughs> You down there? You can. Hell yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You're like ice climbing though. How to get like out. I can get my uh, ice axe. <sighs> so you get, if we can get in is an issue. Wow. What do you think? Um, that's something. <laughs> I think so, yeah. What well, was this? Maybe you guys like. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, this opening is real small. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> yeah, that's a, that's a narrow one.
Alright, I'm in. It's just like a slide. Alright, so we're into the Omega Tunnel. Takes a little bit of sliding down to make that happen. But you can see it's kind of just like a fun slide. That's awesome. <laughs> It my back. Oh, it went on my back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it went down everything. <laughs> oh, snow everywhere. All right. So, after exploring the mine a little bit, we grabbed our shovels, we grabbed our hard hats, and we went in to what we hoped would be a breakthrough of a lifetime. Oh, well, we have one shovel. We can't prepare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, why do you wear a helmet? Yep. There are a couple of different collapses to climb over. And up and down. And this was our baby, so to speak. This is what we thought we could get into. Yeah. So as Jason and I got back there, you know, it seemed that the collapse was a little bit bigger than we remembered, at least in my mind. I remember it being a little bit smaller than that, but that's sometimes, you know, how these things work. This earth is always moving, it's always collapsing, it's always expanding, it's always doing these things. Um, but we were there to get after it. But if you look, if you climb up there and you look in the, just behind that boulder, mm -hmm. it looks like it opens up. Huh. That's yeah. So we're here. You can still see it. So you see, like the 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 mold on above where Jason's doing it. Yeah. See how it's moving. Yeah. So there's definitely air coming through there. Went out a little bit. Now we got. Now we got the top falling right in. Right inside. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> And all of our progress. Oh no! Big, big rocks up the fall. Yeah, it's like, it's still a big maybe. Because it goes like another couple feet, but then there's, there is more rock. But then I don't know if behind this board is open or if it's collapsed. To my left, like right here, it's like actively breaking. And there's huge rocks right here. There's some really big ones up there that I haven't gone yet. You can see that board right there, but then I think it might be an opening to the left or it might just be more of this. I can't really tell. You I think we could do it, but I think it would take like getting like all of this rock out. Out of the way? Yeah. Well, let's see if we can get like this kind of out of the way so we yeah. can assess the, okay. the next one. I'm yep. up for shoveling. All right, let's, let's keep going. Yeah, I got nothing else to do today. There we go. So why, by seeing the air rushing through and hearing rocks on the other side, it made us believe that this collapse must be not that big. And if you were just to dig that much further, all sorts of untold history would be discovered. Probably more. Yeah, there's a couple more similar sized ones up. But I wonder if enough of the ceiling falls so we can just walk over it, like I was saying. Yeah, yeah, just have it, have it. Have it all hole. come down and then just walk over, because it's coming from somewhere, you know? It's not like, it's like there, like what's happening back there. Yeah, exactly. So some big ones up there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we are making progress. Oh. <laughs> the time, Perfect timing. The timing of that. <laughs> so much. Never mind. <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> well, that's something. Yep. Get that other one? I think so. 
then we'll have a clear look at what we're working with. I mean, once you get back here, the airflow is very strong. And the best, the best bet is over here to the right. There's a hole. You can see it from here. See how the much more the stuff's lap, flapping in the wind. Yeah. And if you get back in there and look to the right, there's a to the right of that support beam. There's a hole that seems to go back a ways. But okay. I mean, I think we're dealing with this level of collapse, or at least a little bit longer. A little bit longer. Yeah. Yeah. It's going. It's actually <laughs> might be better even all I here to use this like a piece of wood like a wedge. Yeah. Because I can't that shovel is just too awkward. <laughs> just looks like we have more of these big rocks. But now it's like if what if we just get rid of like 20 of these big rocks? Yeah, but moving those 20 rocks could create a hundred more rocks falling down. Uh-huh. I'll try to move this guy. Nope. Kind of like that. Yeah, just move the one a little bit. So Jason's back there, but uh, basically we've been going at it for an hour or so and uh, we just had a big collapse. But the really intriguing thing about it is behind while the rocks were collapsing this way towards us we could hear rocks collapsing beyond the collapse kind of down this old tunnel it just sounded like rock rolling down an open void so if we were to be able to clap to get past this which it seems to be not that big a collapse there's definitely an opening how long that opening is we don't know but you know it seems like the saga of the omega tunnel continues no <laughs> Eventually, we had to call it quits. You know, I lost a shovel throughout it. We lost some different things. But the reason I bring it up is because we're not done. You know, I'm thinking more and more about the Omega, about how to safely get into this mine. I've been talking to a bunch of different mining engineering companies, especially some people that I've met along the way. And we're wondering if we can shore up that one collapse, you know, and then do a proper day of digging, you know, knowing that the ceiling above us isn't gonna collapse on top of us and kill us, that maybe, just maybe we could get past it. And so as we enter the fourth year up here at Cerro Gordo, I wanted to bring back up the Omega Tunnel because it is top of mind right now. And I am more confident than ever really that we're gonna get through and it's gonna lead to all sorts of new explorations and treasures and who knows what else. So that is three years, 36 months, over a thousand days being able to call this my backyard. And I'm back up to kind of my sunset rock. You know, if you've been watching this channel for a while, you know that almost every sunset back in the day I used to come up here. And I found that slowly I came up here less and less. You know, it seemed like work called more and more and I spent more time coordinating contractors than I did going on hikes, exploring mines, you know, riding my dirt bike, all the things that brought me that childlike wonder, that joy, that just excitement of being up here when I first moved up here three years ago. You know, they say that if you find something that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And that's truly how it felt for that first year here. It was just beautiful. And at some point it just felt like, again, I was coordinating more than I was exploring. And so I think my biggest takeaway for this whole year is just returning to what I love about this place. 
You know, it reminds me of this T.S. Eliot quote. He says something to the effect that we'll never stop exploring, you know, and in the end, when the exploration is done, we'll find ourselves back at the same place and know it for the first time. It's been like back here for the last year. You know, it's been exploring new areas, but also rediscovering old areas. And along with that brings such joy, you know, such excitement. You know, I think my goal from day one coming up here is just to bring life back to this dead town. And for the longest time, I felt like that needed to be one singular goal in the future when everything was perfect and everything was done. I almost didn't want to show anybody or have anybody up until that was the time. But today I look around and we probably had 50 visitors today. You know, we had volunteers humming, building a new library. We had life in every corner of this town. And we could ho fill the hotel a hundred times over with the people that have helped at this point in time. And all of them have their own stories too. You know, so this town isn't abandoned, isn't a ghost town. You know, ghost town implies kind of no present and no future. You know, I've kind of been grappling with that a lot recently of what to call this place. You know, how do I summarize that feeling of this energy that's here, that this town is coming back to life? And after a lot of thinking, you know, I don't think it's the best to call this a ghost town anymore. Uh, I think I'll just call it home. So anyways, I just want to say thank you guys once again. You know, this has just been the wildest journey I could ever imagine. You know, to be able to sit here, look over Owens Lake, look over the mountains, be able to share these adventures, be able to re be reminded of those adventures. You know, oftentimes people say, hey, get back out there and hike, get back out there and explore the mines. I'm doing it and it feels amazing. And I hope in the same vein, maybe you take some inspiration from this and get out there and uh, explore in your own way. You know, go on some adventure where you're going to be sitting a thousand days later, a completely changed person. You know, Cerro Gordo accepts you as you are when you come up here, but it'll definitely change you. And I definitely feel change over the last three years. And I hope that all of you are able to find something like that. I am once again going to sit here, watch the sun go down and just remind myself why I love this place so much. So thank you so much. I'll see you guys next video.